It's amazing. It's uh, 28 past four on Sunday, May 5th, 2019. And I just saw something that is going to take me a long time. So I wanted to jump on here and immediately start providing uh, analysis content for you guys uh, when it comes to the legalization in Illinois. Uh, the bill is going to be introduced, hasn't yet, but it's 525 pages or so long. So a 525 page law. And then yesterday on May 4th, 2019, J.B. Pritzker and the uh, two Democrats in uh, the Illinois legislature uh, released a 10 page summary that was exceedingly difficult for me to find, but I've gotten a copy and now I'm going to go over it with you guys in real time. And so what we can do is jump right in. Um, so it's the adult use cannabis summary. It was nine pages and it says starting on January 1st, 2020, adults over 21 will be able to legally purchase cannabis for recreational use from licensed dispensaries across the state. And then the first thing that they do is they limit the amount of possession of cannabis that you can have for adult use. Uh, that limit is 30 grams of cannabis flour, five grams of cannabis concentrate, 500 milligrams of THC in a cannabis infused product. Just for a small break on that, let's go over how many milligrams of cannabis are typically in edibles, at least in Illinois, but it is also popular amongst the other states. There's usually two strengths. There's the 10 milligram and then there's the 25 milligram. Oftentimes the 25 milligram, I've seen it more uh, only reserved for the medical marijuana as opposed to the adult use cannabis. Uh, so that's basically like five edibles, give or take rule of thumb on that, simply because 100 milligrams of the THC would be considered an edible. And then from that, there's usually 10 smaller pieces, meaning that a edible dose is approximately 10 milligrams. Of course, it changes for everybody, uh, you know, titrate accordingly. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for the limit of 500 milligrams of THC. And then there's a word that says, or again, the actual law is 525 pages. I just got it. I haven't reviewed it yet. We're just going to go over the nine pages and that's still probably going to take some time. Uh, I'm literally reading right off of it. So if I'm not getting to your questions, we'll just save it for the end. Uh, so people may possess more than 30 grams of cannabis if it is grown and secured in their residence under certain conditions. That's right. Illinois is going for home grow. Five plants, more on that later. Let's talk about the cannabis tourists that will be coming from the surrounding states for non-Illinois residents. Non-Illinois residents can have 15 grams of cannabis flour. How much is a uh, how much is that in street terms? Well, remember 3.5 grams is approximately, well, 3.5 grams is one eighth of an ounce. 15 grams would approximately be one half ounce, if an ounce, of course, is 28 grams. And then uh, the remainder of the uh, possession limits for non-Illinois residents are essentially just half of what the Illinois residents can have. Instead of five grams of concentrate, they can have 2.5 grams of concentrate. Uh, small aside, the typical uh, 510 thread of the vape pens that you see is 500 milligrams. So that would be if you're a non-Illinois resident and you had five vape pens, each of 500 milligrams, there you go or 250 milligrams of THC contained in a cannabis infused product. Sorry, I apologize, this is live, just a second. <coughs> oh, yeah, live TV, everybody. The possession limits are to be considered cumulative. Okay, the possession limits are to be considered cumulative. Oof, it gets back to that dreaded ore that they included in there. So that means that pile all the cannabis together and you have to get 30 grams of flour, five grams of cam five, or 500 milligrams of THC. It looks like if they're cumulative, what well, we're going to need to have that more clearly explained uh, is that, I mean, it's weird because you can have all the alcohol in the world in your house, but now we have to quibble over whether or not we are over the line for uh, possession of cannabis. You know, I wonder what the line is for possession of narcotics, especially if you have a prescription for, oh, let's per pick on the opioids. The Compassionate Use of Medical Cannabis pro Pilot Program. 
the legalization of adult cannabis does not alter the state's medical cannabis pilot program. The state has had a medical cannabis pilot program in the state is Illinois. Uh, since approximately 2015, it really kind of got upset and it wasn't a smooth transition from the last Democratic governor to the brief period of Bruce Rauner. And now it's back to J.B. Pritzker. But the current uh, adult, you, I'm sorry, the current medical cannabis pilot program in Illinois is not slated to go uh, out until 2020, and there are bills in uh, in the legislature to extend it indefinitely. Next, uh, this the state of Illinois and its uh, adult use of cannabis is a lot like it reminds me a lot of the Cory Booker bills in uh, Congress right now when it comes to the uh, the justice aspects of the legalization of cannabis. So just a lot like the Marijuana Justice Act or the Next Step Act really addresses uh, promoting equity as what they uh, call it in here. For example, in the adult use uh, uh, bill that's being proposed, it's a creation of a $20 million low interest loan program uh, to be overseen by DCEO, which must be one of the organizations in the executive, uh, will administer a low cost program to qualified social equity applicants. There will be a longer video in the future about social equity applicants to help defray the startup costs associated with entering the licensed cannabis industry. This is a very, uh, a very valid point as you're, we're going to see here as we get off of page one here shortly. Uh, the uh, startup capital for getting into the cannabis space is quite high. And then that startup capital is even higher when you consider the cost of the applicationing, uh, application fees, which are in the tens of thousands of dollars. And the complexity of the applications that are out there and all the steps that go with it. So uh, the people that are going, and by the people, I mean the companies that are going to be in the adult use cannabis space in Illinois, a lot of them are already um, actual cannabis operators. And then the ones that actually want to start up, for example, the social equity applicants, they get a little bit of help. So let's cover this term social equity applicant. A social equity applicant is an Illinois resident that meets one of the following criteria. An applicant with at least 51% ownership and control by more well, by one or more individuals who have resided in at least five of the preceding 10 years in a disproportionately impacted area. Where are these disproportionately impacted areas? I'm not sure. We're going to need to figure out where on the map they are. I know the purpose of this is, of course, to promote equity. So I'm assuming the disproportionately impacted areas are going to be uh, the poorer neighborhoods that have uh, really carried the brunt of the burden of the uh, crime that has been cannabis possession over the past 80 years. Uh, the next uh, criteria is the applicant has to have at least 51% ownership and control by one or more individuals who have been arrested for, convicted, or a judge to be awarded the juvenile court for any offense that is eligible for expungement under this act or member of an impacted family. So again, this is much like the Marijuana Justice Act. We have this expungement that is built into the law. This is a, a very very large, uh, very amazing law in the sense that it is going to try to rectify the crimes of the past and not just legalize uh, and change the law. It is trying to address what the law has done and how it's hurt our people and to, uh, and to make amends. So for applicants with a minimum of 10 full-time employees, an applicant with at least 51% of current employees who, and then currently reside in a disproportionately impacted area, that's going to be a map somewhere where I have to find out where these are uh, and then who have been arrested for it. The applicant for new entrance to the market. Scoring process for the dispensaries. The Department of Agriculture developed a similar process through the rulemaking processors for cultivation centers, processors and craft growers. Big news, everybody. We have these three things now. What do we have? We have a cultivation center, we have a prof processor, and a craft grower. Craft growers, again, this is just a fascinating law. Its, its, it's scope and its vision is very grand. Uh, the legislation contains a scoring process, the, the IDFPR. Uh, I, I'm assuming that IDFPR, I, I'd have to look that up, but it, the Department of Agriculture is also the same um, bureau or the same department in the state of Illinois that currently houses medical plants. And uh, they were just quite busy uh, past week with the uh, opening of hemp permits, which 
as of this right now, approximately 400 hemp farms will open in Illinois in 2019. So out of a total of 200 points, they're going to do this scoring thing that's just similar, I believe. No, no, this is different because they're, they're actually going to be scoring it by social equity applicants on points. And then they're going to use those scores to award another 12 bonus points for... Okay, and you know, labor and employment practices, labor peace agreement, local community neighborhood report, environmental plan, an Illinois owner, and a plan to engage the com community. So this, the, the state is going to be looking at these applicants that are trying to get into the cannabis space, that market, and they are going to score them to see which ones will do the greatest good for the community, which... That's amazing. Again, one of the things that is standing in the way of the vertical centralization of turning cannabis into like as if it was Coca-Cola or McDonald's, that type of thing, is the state's ability to regulate. And the regulation as it is right now looks to really prioritize a decentralized local market in the sense that this is going to be something that people want to buy and it has been for decades. How do you structure the economy in such a way that it can't be uh, run by one big player and that it helps the people that have been burdened by this law for the past uh, 80 years? One of the next points on this is the fee waivers. Uh, that's probably what that stands for. The Department of Financial and Professional Regulations, IDFPR. And the Department of Ag will waive 50% of any non-refundable license application fees up to two applications and any non-refundable fees associated with purchasing a license to operate a cannabis business establishment up to two licenses if social equity applicants meet certain conditions. So again, they are going to be looking for the people and the, the businesses that may exist right now or they may have to be formed. And these businesses that will be formed that will create these social equity applicants, it's gonna be a very exciting and uh, just not only exciting, but like I, I, I can't I mean novel in the sense that I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before with any other states. And please do correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. I know you will, uh, but I haven't seen this before in any other states, adult use or legalization, where they're they're really trying to tackle head on the damage that this law has done over the past 80 years, fee waivers, reducing upfront costs. So uh, the conditional dispensary, applicants who receive a conditional dispensary organization license will have 180 days from the date of the award to identify a physical location for the dispensing organization retail storefront when new entrants are allowed into the market. When new entrants are allowed into the market implies that uh, the market has a ceiling and that ceiling is somewhat great uh, graduated in, in that there, there will be some that open first and then some that open later and later. Uh, and when we get to page four, we're almost done with page two. And I will share this uh, document released by um, uh, the Pritzker uh, office. I'll share this on my website. I'll also, yeah, I'll just, I'll make a web page and then it'll be the thing that I leave in the, in the description section. We'll link back to it. So now there's actually, there's going to be limitations on the ownership. And like I said, they're, they are trying to make this a fairly uh, decentralized market in the sense that there won't be, they're trying to limit how much share, market share, any one particular company can get uh, and crowd out the social, what did they call them again? I should make an acronym about it. The social equity applicants that will be coming into the state and, and, and crowd them out. They're trying to uh, reduce that. So they put limitations on ownership. No person or entity shall hold any legal, equitable or equitable or beneficial interest directly or indirectly of more than three cultivation centers. So let's say that you are in acreage holdings and you're going to come in and you're going to buy all the licenses that you can. Three. No person or entity shall hold any legal, equitable, or beneficial interest directly or indirectly of more than 
10 dispensing organizations. So you grow in three and you can dispense in 10. In theory, if you are any one of these larger cannabis players, MedMen, uh, can Canopy, you know, that's that's a Canadian company that's basically acreage holdings. GTI, for example, they're huge in Chicago, Cresco, uh, Revolution. So three cultivation centers, 10 dispensing organizations, no craft grower license, which is really exciting. We'll be talking about that uh, later, shall be issued to a person or entity with more than a 10% interest in a cultivation center, going back to how they've really created something that's going to be fairly decentralized, which I think is amazing. Uh, so if they have more than a 10% interest in a cultivation center, then you can't be a craft grower. This is this is going to be really, really cool in cannabis because I've never heard of a craft grower. Um, I can't wait to see how these things actually turn out. There will be some time before craft growers are the norm in Illinois. It'll be it'll still be some years. And then no person or entity shall hold any legal, equitable ownership or beneficial interest directly or indirectly of more than one craft grower license under this article. Wow. So let's say that again, let's, let's use Revolution Cannabis because they're a large player. So Revolution Cannabis could have their craft uh, grower license for one craft thing, but then they, they cannot own more than a 10% interest in a cultivation center. Oh yeah, right. Uh, so they've just crowded them out. So they, uh, I don't think Acreage Holdings is going to be getting themselves a craft grower license in the state of Illinois anytime soon identified disproportionately impacted areas. Oh, great, because we talked about how we need to see this map. And then also, yes, here's here it is. Dip disproportionately impacted area is defined as a geographic area that is economically disadvantaged and has been impacted by high rates of arrest, conviction, and incarceration for violations of the Cannabis Control Act. Cannabis Control Act is essentially uh, like the Controlled Substances Act, but uh, on the state level and strictly toward cannabis. And then, well, you see, of course, one of the reasons why uh, states have the police power. So states are supposed to typically pass the criminal laws. The federal government, that's one of the reasons why they had the um, Marijuana Tax Stamp Act, uh, because they didn't think that they could actually make crimes back at that time, kind of like how states could make crimes. There were still some federal crimes, of course, but there were very, very few in, uh, compared to how they got after the Controlled Substances Act with the uh, federal drug war that they had. Uh, but be that as it may, I just wanted to say that uh, the Cannabis Control Act, Illinois' uh, cannabis crime uh, law, and then also typically the states have police power. So achieving equity through ownership and licensure back to this equity concept which is just interesting and i i, I can't wait to see how this plays out uh, early approval adult use license for current medical cannabis license holders so this is speaking to the companies that currently have medical cannabis licenses so the timeline for licensing Cultivation organizations, medical cannabis cultivators, uh, cultivators may apply for a license within 60 days of the effectiveness of this act. So let's talk about that. When is this act going to become effective? I'm not sure exactly. And we're going to have to wait and see uh, because this bill, again, I don't believe that the actual bill has been introduced. I think what I have gotten is uh, a copy of the bill that is being circulated and hasn't been filed yet. It's still over 520 pages. But um, so once this law becomes effective, within that 60 days, the large players will all be applying for their uh, cultivation organization licenses. And then licenses will be distributed to eligible applicants within 45 days. You see all the background checks and whatnot uh, for the medical cannabis companies in Illinois have already all been done. So they aren't grandfathering them in uh, so to say, so to speak, but they are providing them with uh, an expedited line. For example, the current medical operators in the state of Illinois have essentially been granted the TSA pre-check line, and they will be the first uh, organizations that are really going to come into the game in the state of Illinois. Dispensing organizations. Medical cannabis dispensaries may apply for a license within 60 days of the effective date of the act. Uh, licenses will be distributed to eligible applicants within 14 days. The sale of adult use cannabis will begin on January 1st, 2020. For that to happen, this bill has to be passed shortly. And then these uh, operators in the state of Illinois need to get all their uh, forms 
and applications in a row very, very quickly. Typically applications come from the state. So I'm not sure if the state is dealing directly with the handful of medical cannabis cultivators already in the state of Illinois or what, but if they're going to try to make the January 1st, 2020 will be the first date of business, uh, they're just gonna need to be a public private partnership that is really working to make that happen. License costs for early approval adult use cultivation organizations, a non-refundable permit fee of $100,000, cannabis business development fee, 5% of total sales between July 1st, 2018 to July 1st, 2019, or half a million bucks, whichever is less. So if you uh, really want to help those cannabis businesses uh, pay that development fund, fee, uh, go to your local dispensaries uh, in the state of Illinois, medical cannabis patients, please, uh, before July 1st. And, uh, you know, remember, they will get limited at 500000 So uh, license number one, a non-refundable permit fee of $30,000. Cannabis business development fund of 3% of total sales between July 1st okay, or $100,000 or whatever is less. So that is a license one dispensing organization. So for the dispensaries, the price is a little bit cheaper than for the cultivation centers. And then they have a license number two. These two licenses, I am not sure because it just says number one and number two. And again, I'll, I'll share this so that you can review it and I'll dig into that and do more of these types of posts, of course, as this is brand flipping new. So new entrance into the adult use cannabis market. There are one, two, three, four, five different types. New licenses or new entrants, license types, cultivation center, craft grower, processor, transportation organization. Hmm, can you get weed delivered? Uh, dispensing organizations. And of course, dispensing organizations, that's where you buy it. Transporting organizations, I'm not sure if that is going to be um, like Uber of weed or if it is going to be some type of security that is transporting it. We'll, we'll find out more. Let's talk about the timelines that these will happen in. May 1st, 2020, the agency awards licenses for 75 new dispensing organizations. So it looks like the state of Illinois is going to open another 75 dispensaries for adult use by May 1st, 2020. Department of Agriculture. As of July 1st of 2020, the agency will award 40 licenses for processors, 40 licenses for craft growers, and licenses for transporting organizations. Well, because they don't give me a number, I'm assuming that transporting organizations aren't going to have a cap. So we're going to have 40 processors, 40 licensed craft growers, and 75 new dispensaries will be awarded in approximately 18 months. Well, one year to uh, yeah, yeah, July 1st, May 1st of 2020. Wave two. So if you don't make it in the first time, you have until December 21st, 2021, and then the agency will award another 110 licenses for dispensing organizations. And also on the same date of December 21st, 2021, uh, the state will award up to 60 additional craft growers and up to 60 additional processors. So there will be, by 2022, there could be 100 craft growers for cannabis in the state of Illinois. The licensing costs for the new entrants, the craft grower. Craft grower has a licensing fee of $5,000 and a non-refundable application fee of $5,000. A processor, a processor has the same $5,000 and $40,000. A transporting organization, a transporting organization has the $5,000 of the application fee and a license fee of $10,000. And for dispensing organizations, $5,000 and $30,000. You know what is interesting? dispensing organizations, licensed processors, 40 craft growers. It appears that they will not be doing any additional uh, cultivation organizations that aren't the ones that are grandfathered in for the current medical cannabis license holders. Fascinating. Now, investing in communities that suffered through the war on drugs. The proposal will establish a new grant, the Restoring Our Communities, ROC, program to invest in communities that have suffered the most because of discriminatory drug policies. The ROC program overview. 
And there will be locations where applicants will be eligible to apply for state funding through the Rock Board. The Rock Board will have 22 members and be chaired by the governor or his designee and the attorney general or his designee. The Rock Board will develop a grant application, solicit applications from eligible Rock areas and distribute the grants across the state and monitor and evaluate the Rock program. The Rock Board will deliver an annual report to the government governor's office about its progress. Think about that, we've created a revenue source. And then we said, okay, there's been this terrible war on drugs. Go fix it, which is pretty sweet. And they, they call it the Rock Program. All right, so expunge records. The following standalone offenses shall be eligible for expungement. So uh, it looks like possession uh, from 10 grams, 10 to 30 grams, 30 to 100 grams, 100 to 500 grams. Those will be all eligible for expungement. There's a lot of people in Illinois that could benefit from the, the, the being arrested and charged for possession. Manufacture and deliver, uh, 2.5 grams to 30 grams. Those ones, section eight plants. Uh, it looks like if you had less than 20 plants, uh, uh, class four felony is kind of the, cut, the cutoff, it appears. So as long as your, your felony was a class four or below, it appears that you will be able to uh, have your record expunged. The process for the expungement, the state police is going to identify people. They have 180 days from the effective date of the act. So they tell the state police to go over there and make sure that all these people that qualify for those conditions or those, those violations of the Cannabis Control Act, within six months, they set deadlines and they, they set procedure. The attorney's general's office can file an order if the state's attorney's not. Uh, the court will review the order. And then the court will provide copies of the order to the Department of State Police, arresting agency, relevant criminal justice agencies, and the individual whose record has been expunged. You see, all these cases have case case numbers. Now, I don't do criminal law. I'd have to talk to Jeff about this. But um, it, it, all those files that are out there in the public record would then, the automatic expungement process does not apply to individuals with misdemeanors or class four filings that were accompanied by other charges other than qualifying offenses. Individuals with those records and other circumstances may separately petition the court to have their records expunged. Okay, so within the 180 days, they tell the state police and the state to go get rid of those cannabis only crimes. So provided that was cannabis only, then the automatic expungement process is working for you. If it was accompanied by uh, another crime, then you as the uh, accused, but he's already been found guilty, convicted, uh, you as the convicted will then go and get the uh, uh, review, have the court review their record and have that aspect of it expunged. Employment. Nothing prohibits the employers from adopting reasonable employment policies concerning smoking, consumption, storage, or use of cannabis in their workplace. Nothing in the pro proposal prohibits employers from disciplining an employee or terminating employment of an employee for violating the employer's employment policies or workplace drug policy. Many employers have a zero tolerance drug policy. Many employers, the vast majority of the ones that are businesses, uh, by the way, are private. And uh, because they're private, they like to think that they can create their own rules to a large extent they can. It's their business. They're allowed to run it how they see fit. If they want to have a drug policy that, you know, calls for people to be terminated for it, they're allowed to. Uh, that's And that's, that's really across the board. Uh, the Medical Cannabis Act does have uh, prohibitions against discrimination, but it appears that the adult use one, especially when it comes to employment, will not uh, have those. And then it gets to the real stuff, the money. Taxation. All taxes are deposited in the new cannabis regulation fund. So we will find out how much money the state of Illinois will make from cannabis in the future. Cultivation privilege tax. That's right. It is a privilege to cultivate marijuana in the state of Illinois. 7% of the gross receipts from the sale of cannabis by a cultivator, comma, craft grower, comma, or processor to a dispensing organization. So they hit it at that particular level. It's kind of like a VAT tax. So every time the cannabis moves down the line, it is taxed again. And then there is the cannabis purchaser excise tax. That's on you when you go and buy cannabis. 10% of the purchase price for cannabis with a THC level at or below 35%. All flour, 
like all flour, they, even the best flour I've ever seen has never cracked 35%. Maybe it can, maybe there's some 37 out there. I'm not sure, but most flour uh, is, is less than 35%. Moon rocks, I'm not including because that's got stuff on it. And then 20% of the purchase price of all cannabis infused products. There you go. So that, those would be your tinctures, your edibles, that type of stuff. 25% of the purchase price on cannabis with a THC level above 35%. Uh, I'm assuming that'll be like your vape pens, your concentrates will be taxed at 25% of the purchase price. These taxes will be in addition to occupation, privilege, excise taxes imposed by the state or by any municipal corporation or political subdivision. There we go. So in another ripple, the cities, and by the way, the potholes here in Peoria are terrible, uh, can get involved and they can uh, put another tax on it on their municipal level. Municipal purchaser excise tax. Municipalities may enact a purchaser excise tax up to 3% in increments of 2.5, of one quarter percent. Uh, right now, I can hear all the municipalities immediately putting their excise tax at 3%. Counties may enact a purchaser excise tax at up 2.5% in incorporated areas in increments of a quarter point. Same thing. Unincorporated areas may have a 3.5% uh, excise tax on it. Usually unincorporated areas, they are, they are very rural. And so they usually don't have very much money. Probably why they can do 3.5%. Allocation of state revenue. The Department of Revenue will provide an official FY20 revenue estimate in the coming days. Oh, that's going to be exciting. Uh, tax revenue will be deposited into the new Cannabis Regulation Fund, and then state agencies responsible for administering the adult use cannabis program will receive resources to cover administrative costs from the taxes collected by the program. All remaining revenue will be allocated as follows. 35% will be transferred to the General Revenue Fund. That's just paying for the state. That's where most of the tax dollars go. 25% will be transferred to the Restoring Our Communities, ROC, Fund for Community Reinvestment. So era, 25 cents of every tax dollar will go right back to fixing the war on drugs in the state of Illinois. That is great. 20% will be transferred to a fund that will support mental health and substance abuse services. fan flipping tastic because that is the stuff that nobody ever funds. 10% will be transferred to the Budget Stabilization Fund to pay the backlog of unpaid bills. That's pretty good. I mean, like only 10 cents is going to pay uh, the state's uh, unpaid bills, but the state has unpaid bills, man. 8% uh, will be transferred to the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board to create a law enforcement grant program. You got to wet the cop's beak, man. You're telling them to change their job. 2% uh, will be transferred to the Drug Treatment Fund to fund public education and awareness. Governance, we have the governor's office. The governor is gonna appoint a cannabis regulatory oversight officer who will be stationed in the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulatory. Uh, person and his team will have the authority to make statutory regulations. Oh man, this, this guy is gonna have a very uh, long task. If the, if the law is 500 pages, and the cannabis, cannabis regulatory uh, oversight officer is, is going to have a very important and, and difficult job of taking that 525 pages and turning it into what could over, be over a thousand pages of regulations. It, it could easily be over a thousand pages of reg regulations. Department of Revenue, of course, collect the taxes. Department of Ag, uh, license oversight cultivation centers. Uh, it, it looks like they will just expand uh, the Department of Medicinal Plants to uh, include the adult use as they, it makes sense. That's already that those groundwork is already in, in place. And now they're going to have everything uh, from hemp to medical to adult uh, financial and professional regulation. And they're going to have license and oversight of dispensing or, or dispensing organizations. The state police will do background checks and uh, security plans for licensed entities and also uh, background checks, criminal history. And the Department of Public Health will be responsible for developing recommendations surrounding health warnings. You educate the public, of course. Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, uh, responsible for administering a loan program. Uh, the grant program, the technical assistance for social equity applicants, uh, Department of Human Services, 
Uh, let's see, making recommendations to the adult use and committee regarding drug treatment and prevention and the ICJIA responsible for designating rock areas uh, across the state. So we, we do not yet know what these rock areas are. We know their criteria being the places in the state that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Now we get to the page eight, public health and safety. 20% of revenue generated by sale of adult use cannabis will support efforts to address substance abuse and mental health. And that is really it. I'm not sure if you guys have tried CBD, but I've had uh, a lot of my friends try it and uh, there's their anxiety, their recurring uh, thoughts, you know, their antingular singlet gyrus, that one, the, uh, the OCD one, just kind of relaxes them and they're able to Calm down, which is kind of nice. Um, but, uh, you know, off the soapbox on that one. So I'm, I'm really interested in seeing what type of revenue is going to be generated to help substance abuse and mental health. Advertising, no cannabis business shall place or maintain or cause to be placed or maintained a cannabis product in any form through any medium. Okay. Within, now I realize like, there's beer ads on the Super Bowl, and there wasn't even a cannabis ad on the Super Bowl. But it appears because the, you have a First Amendment right to advertise. It's free speech. However, they are allowed to make reasonable regulations on that. For example, the first one within 1,000 feet of the perimeter of a school, playground, hospital, healthcare, recreation center, childcare, public park, or public library any arcade which the mission is not restricted to persons 21 years or older, or public transportation, or publicly owned or operated property. Or you can't also then false and misleading, that's incorrect of course, uh, includes any image designed to appeal to minors. So like Joe Camel, <laughs> can't do that anymore. Or you can't have the Flintstones smoking cigarettes. And these restrictions do not apply to non-commercial messages. Now, of course, advertising is the commercial free speech, but the non-commercial messages, then you really don't need a billboard that reminds you, hemp, it's legal. Uh, and it's, it appears that, yeah, no cannabis business establishment. I, I don't believe that includes hemp, but there's not going to be uh, that type of of advertisement for the cannabis businesses. Packaging requirements. The packaging will have, of course, a warning and the warning will be for 21 and over. It, it may, and then of course, it's not all that different from the warning that you see uh, on uh, beer. However, it says it's unlawful to sell or provide this item to an individual and may not be transported outside the state of Illinois. Uh, and then there's a warning against operating a motor vehicle. And then there's a warning that the Possession or use of this product may carry significant legal penalties in some jurisdiction and under federal law. So all harvested cannabis intended for distribution to a cannabis enterprise must be packaged in a sealed labeled container. Packaging of any product containing cannabis shall be child resistant and light resistant with current standards. Sounds like it's going to be very similar to the medical uh, cannabis that the state currently have. The label of each cannabis product shall contain, among other things, a use by date. That's kind of nice. Uh, all cannabis products must contain a warning statement established for consumers of a size to be legible and readable, visible to a consumer inspecting a package, which may, may, may not be covered or obscured in any way. Uh, so make sure that the warning is conspicuous. Packaging must not contain uh, false or misleading statements, promotes, uh, promotes excessive cons uh, consumption, depicts a person under 21 using cannabis, uh, no childlike images, cartoons, or anything else that appeals to kids, uh, contains any uh, seal, flag, crest, coat of arms, or any other insignia uh, likely to mislead the consumer to believe that the product has been endorsed, made, or used by the state of Illinois. So keep the state of Illinois' uh, logo off of it. This is I'm not sure. I haven't been to Colorado in a few months, but I would, I would, they put their flag on everything in Colorado. So I'm wondering if the Colorado adult use law has a similar prohibition or if there's Colorado cannabis products that have like its flag on it. Like, so they put its flag on everything. Uh, but anyway, 
Home Grow. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sticking around to page nine. Now it's the most exciting thing. So if you thought that this review of the entire uh, Illinois adult use legalization has been helpful, please subscribe and we will continue to do these types of videos all the way up through and to uh, legalization on a federal level. But again, legalization won't be done for a while. So uh, let's go to the home grow that Illinois has. Uh, Illinois households are permitted to grow up to five cannabis plants under certain conditions. The grower is an adult age 21 or older. The grower is in a household that owns the residence or has permission from the owner. The grower is limited to growing five or less plants. The grower must keep cannabis in a separately locked room away from members of the household who are under 21 and the grower is prohibited from growing cannabis in public view. Do you hear that? D do you? Because I hear a whole bunch of uh, builders out there in the state of Illinois going, you know, why would we make that a fifth bedroom when we could make it a grow room? Oh, man, I'm going to I'm going to get a new grow room in my house I'm gonna create a cottage industry. We're going to we're going to specialize in grow room construction and repair. OK, local ordinances is the final thing on the page nine. So local ordinances, municipalities may pass ordinances prohibiting the establishments of dispensaries in their jurisdiction. But OK, whatever. Cities, if they don't want it, they won't have it. But, uh, you know, if if the city needs the money, they're probably going to have it. The city doesn't need the money. It's probably Naperville. So um, local units of government must adopt opt out ordinances, which I like. Because there's two ways to do things, opt in, opt out. How do you set your defaults? I say you set your default with opt out and you're already in because then compliance rates go up to 85%. If you set your defaults the opposite way, compliance rates usually hover and max out around 45%. They've opted, they've, they've set their, their defaults as opt in. That means that now it's up to the municipality to be like, well, hold on a second. We don't want all this money. Come on, Phil. You know, uh, weren't you just saying the state, I mean, the city has enough money in its coffers the other day? Well, that's that's true. I, I did run on the uh, the platform of we've got it all going on. Nobody's ever been elected with that. So uh, as the date approaches, I'm assuming a lot of the, the ordinances, I'm sorry, a lot of the local units of government in the state of Illinois, especially the ones that need money, won't opt out. They will allow the adult use to go into effect and then they will municipalities may enact reasonable zoning restrictions pertaining to licensed cultivation centers craft growers processing organizations and dispensaries that in i have no idea how long i've been on there's a lot of comments and i'm sorry i'm sorry I, oh my gosh 42 minutes so i've been on for 42 minutes and then i've mostly been looking at uh, this and reading from the summary released by J.B. Pritzker's office yesterday, I have a copy of the 525-page uh, adult use law, and a lot more of these will be made. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to come on live and just read it to you guys. Now I'm going to go chop this up, and then there'll be a link to where you can find this stuff, and it'll be free, and you can you can read it. Give me a call if you need anything. My name's Tom. I'm a cannabis lawyer. And I'll be back real soon.